Hello everyone, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm John Luca and I work as a developer. In the past I work as a SRE, as a reliability engineer, and I'm a lot involved with cloud computing, Kubernetes, and stuff like that. Today I'm here to speak with you about observability and with a project in mind that is called OpenTelemetry. So this is what we're gonna look at today. So let's start from something more general about pros and cons about cloud computing, Kubernetes and microservices. So what those ha have in common and what's good and what's bad about those. There are both of them. They have a lot of good stuff. They bring a lot of good stuff to us and that's why they are so popular. So cloud computing and Kubernetes gives you an API that you can use programmatically to build automation and to deploy your application. Not only that, but you can control the life cycle of your application as you prefer. So this is very important because applications are uh, critical. We have to look at them. We have to take care of what they are doing and they have to be distributed across um, clusters and cloud provider for reliability. The problem accounts is the distribution itself because distribution is crucial for a success, but it's also very complicated. Like if you think about how easy it is to monitor a single process on a single laptop or in a single server, um, that's way different when you have to replicate that across like cloud providers or across like regions or continents. So this, this distribution makes stuff way harder and more distributed you are, uh, more complicated it is. And cloud computing and Kubernetes makes the distribution way simpler, way more affordable, and that increases complexity. Microservices is a way you write application to make them to scale, not only the application itself, but also the teams that work on your product, because you can have smaller team that works on a segmented piece of your application or your, or your business, and they can work by themselves and you can scale them up and down as you wish them. So it, it gives you way more control and scalability, but it also means that you have a lot more to manage at what you are usually, um, you know, you usually have to take care when you have one gigantic application. So I think we can summarize pros and cons here has, um, you know, you get better scalability, you get more um, like distribution across the network, but that has a price. And the price is all about how do you manage and how do you understand what's going on in your system. So it has consequences, for example, of mm, you know, deploying an application across cloud provider is that you get a resiliency budget because your application runs better. And if one region goes down, you have the other one. But this means that you don't get like a single way to say, oh, this is broken or this application doesn't work because it will may work in a region, but it will may be down in another one. So you have to figure out where it's broken, how it's broken, and if it's broken for how many people. So those questions are not, and you don't have those questions when you have a single like um, replicas or when you have a single data center and so on, when the distribution is lower, because yeah, if it go down, go down. That's a pro because uh, it's easy to maintain, but it's a con because usually you want to keep everything up and running all the time. So this is kind of the friction that you have when you think about onboarding Kubernetes cloud computing. It's all good, but it's complicated. I also never heard like a customer complaining about my application using too many CPUs. Like when I get ticket supports for e-commerce that says that they can pay or that the page doesn't load fast enough, but nobody ever complained about CPUs. But from my, from my experience, everybody cares about CPU. I mean, when I go um, in a company, I see graphs and dashboards all about CPU, packet lost and all those stuff that like customer really don't care about because they come from a different perspective. And this is part of the story that I want to tell. Like those metrics, CPU, memory are important, but the business requires other metrics 
and as a developer we are there to meet their expectation so we have to figure out a way to make this to work so customers doesn't complain about the quality of my code either i can write the worst code that works as like very good and they are happy or i can write the perfect code that doesn't meet their criteria and they are not able to use the outcome of my uh, workflow so this this is important they don't care about cpu they don't care about code quality they care about uh, the product to be up and running, reliable and useful for them. But I care about uh, those stuff as a developer because for me, um, the consequence of, about writing good code that is reliable, that is easy to maintain, that is um, that doesn't use all my like computer resources um, is important because by consequence usually means that the customers are happier. But they don't care. I have to find a way to write those stuff in a way that has a direct impact to them. And one of the best way is to use the metrics that they think that we think are important for the customer. So if you think that the customer doesn't care about CPU in your e-commerce, what does it care about? Maybe they care about like the the number of products that you can suggest to them or the number or the latency to opening a detail of the product. So all those metrics has to be aggregated with the CPU, with the memory, with the one that we know about to get something useful out of them. If you look only at one, uh, only at one signal, it's usually like complicated to, uh, to make it to work. Usually that doesn't describe enough the world that we are in. So let's take a break because there is a lot already here and I'm going to give you a brief presentation about myself. So I'm Gianluca Arbezzano and I come from Italy. I live in Turin, very close to the Hals in the north. And I work at Packet as a um, senior staff sort of uh, software engineer. And you can find me around as a Gianarb. I'm on Twitter and I blog. I use Twitter a lot. So if you have any question or, you, or you, if you're looking to chat about those stuff like cloud computing, observability, monitoring, just see you there. And when I'm not developing, I grow vegetables in my garden. So this is the best season to see some pictures about like tomatoes and potatoes and so on. So uh, see you there. So my question for you, or let's say the question I usually try to do at myself when I design a system or when I code is how do I tell a story for a request? So let's say that I, let's, Let's say that I have a you know website that uh, serves you know let's let's stay strict with the e-commerce because it's easy. Um, so how how I tell a story for a specific payment for a customer? Like as we know the microservices like if we do microservices we have a lot of different pieces and the payment request goes through all of them trying to uh, you know fulfill the request. But how do we describe all the story for a specific payment? Or let's say that you are designing a new feature, like you are adding like, um, I don't know, you are adding like a comment box, a way to leave feedback to, uh, to a product. Um, this will may involve like writing a few microservices, deploy them, interact with some other microservices that are already there, like the metadata database, for example. And how do you, tell the story of this new feature from the outside. So let's say that you wake up tomorrow and nothing works because something like is broken. How do you look and trying to figure out that, that solution? So this question is very, is very important and I do it during like code review, for example, because that's the good place where I can interact with myself or with the developer that I'm reviewing the code for and we can try to figure out how to make that feature observable. And that's where observability comes from. Or, I mean, what about like third party services? Maybe for the code you write, that's simple because you can write logs or you can send events, but like, how do you uh, figure out what's going on in MySQL if your, pay your payments at the end goes to MySQL, for example? It, in, it's also very hard to make developer to agree on something. We all know that like they like to complain, we are complain driven people and that makes everything hard. So how do you 
uh, design, uh, how do you tell the story of your request if you write like microservices that come from different languages? In some way, you have to agree at some standard at the end, and this is hard. So Open Telemetry helps you to do that. So Open Telemetry is a specification that describes how you instrument your code to be able to figure out what's going on in your application from the outside, because this is what we do with the monitoring. I mean, we open a dashboard, we look at the logs, but we are outside looking for the inside state of the application. And this is the definition of observability in control theory. So trying to figure out what's going on inside the system from the outside. So you try to dig in the internal state of your application from your point of view, from your desktop. And Open tele Telemetry helps you, gives you a specification and client libraries that you can use in your code to expose metrics in a way that are the same across many languages. Because that's what we need. At the end of the story, we need the full story, no matter which language you are using, which cloud provider you are using, or whatever. We just have the full. We just need the full story. So your application um, may have like a language, or at least it has a language that it speaks. And the language that the application speaks is the one that you are able to teach to the application itself. So logs, for example, are a language that the application use to tell you something. And we are the, the one writing logs. So if we, like after a couple of weeks, get back to the logs and we can't figure out what they are, it's our fault as a developer because we didn't write code that is understandable from the outside at least. So a bunch of uh, like stuff that you can look at to make your application to speak in a clear language is to use structured logs. So think about structured logs, not has a message that has a timestamp, but has a timestamp that has a set of key value pairs. Maybe one is the message that is the human readable one, but there are other stuff that you can maybe print as a JSON and parse after that. So you can think about the, those other stuff as a way to you know, print the state, the context of your application. So in the e-commerce, it will be like the product ID, it will be uh, the customer ID, it will be the payment service that you may use. So all those stuff comes together in your log line. So you can have the message, but you can also build the context around that message at that specific point in time. And then this is how you do structural logs because they are not like um, so something that you have to string match or that you have to index like in a search engine, uh, but it's something that you can parse as a JSON. And from there it's way easier to make aggregation and so on. So context propagation is this ability, this uh, ability to you know, um, enrich your log with information that comes from uh, the application in the, at the point where the logs get printed. So the correlation is an ID that usually floats, um, gets generated from every request, every request has its own one, and it goes through all the requests. In this way, you can say, okay, give me um, all the logs that comes from the request ID or the correlation ID, one, two, three, four, five, and you get only the one that are related to, um, to that specific request. This correlation ID or this request ID is something that we see a lot when, when we do traces. I will tell you what, like, what tracing is later, but think about it when you open the, de uh, the dev tools on Chrome, and you go in the network, you see all the bars that uh, represent the time spent from the browser downloading all the assets that your page requests. And you see that all the bars um, are, have time and you can figure out the entire picture that is called a trace um, split by asset. This is a trace and every line is a span. Other than that, your application can also expose events and events are like the number of logins, or um, the number of products that a customer saw split group by product itself. All those stuff are events that usually you can see them as a counter, so numbers that goes up, or gauge that are numbers that you know goes back and forth, and you can aggregate them and group by a specific um, key. 
So when I think about like monitoring or infrastructure monitoring, I think about something like this. I have the telemetry generator that are like our applications. It will be, it will may be your application or it, or it will may be a third party application like MySQL, RabbitMQ or whatever. Um, you send all those metrics or to a collector or the collector goes and takes the metrics. Pull versus push is a debate that uh, in monitoring will stay forever. So that's not important, but there is a collector that usually uh, applies back pressure, back, plash, back pressure and push them to the storage. Uh, the storage is the place where your metrics lives. So I put together a list of, uh, for all of those categories. As I said, the telemetry generator is the easiest one because it's everything, like everything that exposes a matrix. Your application in Go, JavaScript, Node.js, whatever. Um, the collector are agents that usually runs inside a server and collects all the metrics coming from the, the, your applications and push them to a storage. There are collectors open source like Telegraph or Prometheus Exporter or OpenTelemetry has a collector itself. Uh, Jaeger, New Relic has an agent, Logstash is an agent and so on. The storage are places where you can store those information. Uh, Cassandra is one, InfluxDB, Prometheus. There are also has a service one like Honeycomb or New Relic or open source like Elastic, Elasticsearch. Those are usually called time series databases. Obviously you can store those kind of metrics everywhere, but if you use a time series database, it is designed for time series, let's say. So it's a little bit more efficient. Some of the technology that I touched or that we will touch uh, during this talk has those logos. I just, push, I just put them there because I think it will give you an idea or maybe you will rely on them like Googling around or you know, surfing the net for those information. So let's back to what it is a trace. So a trace looks like this. So it's like the trace is, a, is the full picture and you see um, at, the, at the left that there is a column with a bunch of IPs and those are the services that uh, you have in your microservices environment. And every uh, span that is the bar um, is, is a request. So you can see that a specific request goes across your entire system and you can see how much time it, it, is, it gets spent to each of them. Or you can even see like how many times a service is reached um, during, uh, to fulfill a, a request. Like for example, during one of my debugging session with Traces, I, and I realized that I were calling like the authentication service uh, for four times, five times uh, for every request because I was all the time like requiring to check the authentication to token and that was too much. Um, so I was able to make some op optimization and to save some uh, request and make my, my you know, response way faster. When you click on the span, you have the ability to see like the uh, metadata attached to every span. So for example, I'm saving the, comp the name of the components in this case, I was, I was tracing the AWS request. So from the AWS client, the SDK, I, I, were tracing, I was tracing all the, the requests that uh, I, were, I was doing to the AWS. This visualization, those are screenshots that comes from Zipkin. Zip, Zipkin is a popular tracer uh, written in Java. If you are more familiar with Go, um, you can use Jaeger as well. Uh, there are links about those stuff at the end of the slides as well. So the, obviously it doesn't care, I don't care about like uh, the language that you write uh, to, it's like a, you, can, you can look at them as a database. So Jaeger and Zipkin are like a database that you can push all your metrics in. So it doesn't matter where they come from. And later I will show you a few examples with JavaScript obviously. So when I think about like code instrumentation is critical for your, for your application because that's how a developer teach the application, uh, the language, uh, the proper language that you will look at when trying to solve an issue. And usually your application has logging, metrics, and tracing. It is a big part of your application. It's not just a few lines of code. There are proper libraries, and in some way you have to organize them. So in 
the idea is that you can tr you should try to encapsulate those stuff as far away as you can from the business logic. This is hard for logging, but for tracing and metrics, it's a bit a bit is a little bit easier, and you can use like event listener and stuff like that. Another important part is the propagation, because as you realized, like there are, there is a bag of information that has to go from a service to another, and how do you move the correlation ID between all those stuff? It depends on the lang on the protocol that you are using. For example, in HTTP um, or TCP, you can use the headers. So one of the propagation formats is called B3, and it works in this way. So this is a TCP an HTTP request, as, as, uh, as you can see, the headers contains a bunch of X-B3 stuff, and those are information from the trace itself. So the, 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 the service that, rec that make the request pass those headers and the server that received the request is able to um, bundle them and you know create its span that has the same trace ID as a parent. So you can create the hierarchy that we saw before. So this is a, a, bit, a bit of an overview about how tracing works in practice, but let's see how OpenTelemetry.js works. So OpenTelemetry.js is a library that you know follow the open tracing the open telemetry uh, specification but and it it is written in javascript so you can check it out um i learned a lot about looking just looking at the foldering so i decided to share the foldering with you because i think it's critical to figure to you know have a good understanding about how the application works so as you can see there is a folder it's called examples and there are examples about how to trace like http uh, request HTTPS request or DNS request or SQL request and those, those kind of stuff. So you get a sample application that uh, helps you um, to figure out what's going on. Uh, there is another directory that is called packages and the packages uh, f gives you um, a concrete implementation about uh, like how to trace specific components. Like for example, you can trace um, gRPC request or HTTP request, HTTPS request, and so on. Uh, those stuff, you just have to import those packages and your, app, your application will be traced automatically. So as you can see, there are like prefix open telemetry plugins for the plugin that helps you to instrument your application, but there are also uh, open telemetry exporter that are, um, that those packages contains the code that teaches open telemetry where to push your metrics. So as you can see, there is Jaeger and Zipkin that are the popular tracer that uh, I told you about. Uh, there is also an exporter for Prometheus because uh, that is a time series database that it's used to store events. Um, and uh, so because the open telemetry supports traces and events. So this is one of the example I took from the examples directory. And as you can see, this is a server um, written with the HTTP package. And for what concerns traces, it's easy, it, it, it is just easy as importing like a single file. In this case, the example uh, HTTP server. And uh, that file pro uh, provision and provide you a trace. Uh, configure it as you wish with the right plugins and with the right exporter. So let's have a look at how the example HTTP server uh, look like. This is it. As you can see, we import, we, requ we require like a bunch of uh, core libraries from OpenTelemetry, the API, the node, and the tracing. And you also have to decide um, where to push your metrics. And in this example, based on an environment variable, we can switch between Jaeger and Zipkin. So we import both exporter. And as you can see, uh, we inject into the tracer, uh, the concrete exporter. So here you can see that there are no plugins. And this is because the tracer itself comes, comes, from, uh, comes with a specific set of plugins already. Um, provisioned by default. So you don't have to do anything more than that to get a trace from an HTTP request. 
and also to get it propagated through uh, the next one. So um, how does it work? I mean, it looks too easy and it is true. And I think as a JavaScript developer, we are in the unique, in, you know, we are lucky because we can wrap our like functions, every function from the outside. And this is cool because it helps you to write automations, uh, to write, you know, um, tracing code that doesn't go into the business logic because you can do it by, by the, from the outside. And this is uh, important and we, uh, Shimmer is the library that is used by OpenTelemetry uh, to, um, to instrument all the code from the outside. And this is why you don't, you don't have to go uh, in every line of your code and do the instrumentation as you will may do in other languages like Golang because Golang doesn't have this ability. Uh, Java has it because you can instrument the JVM, um, but not for, for JavaScript, this is very cool. And yeah, if you have to write your uh, specific instrumentation for your business code, uh, you can use Shimmer as well because it's, it's very simple and you don't have to go where your application is. So this is it. Um, I, I, leave, I will leave you a bunch of links because the topic is very big and I hope these uh, slides and presentation will help you, uh, you know, to figure out that this is a topic and it's not too hard compared with other languages for JavaScript developer to pick it up with tracing. And I think it's super important when you do, uh, when you have a distributed system or also with a monolithic that is very asynchronous. So I use it a lot when I have queues or when I do event sourcing because uh, I can tell the story for all the events or for all the process and I can follow the message in the queues and I can tell for how long it stays and which worker process it uh, and, and so on. So the first link is my, GitHub, it's my Twitter account because you can reach me out there, my DMs are open. Uh, the second one is the open telemetry when you can learn more about the specification and you can see all the other languages supported like Python, Golang, PHP and so on. Um, the third one is my blog where I wrote about tracing and open telemetry as well. Jaeger is the pop, one of the popular tracer that I um, spoke about, so you can use it uh, in open source. And uh, it's also sponsored by the, the CNCF. So Honeycomb is a company that provides an as a service solution for, for observability. And they have a cool blog where they write a lot about these stuff, uh, those topics. So check them out uh, because they are like on top of the of this topic um, the, the um, open telemetry has a gitter community so you can go there and chat they are super reliable i learn a lot from them and you can also contribute because it's it's open source so check out the repository itself and the last link is an application in node.js that i wrote and that i instrumented with open telemetry uh, it is a, um, a sample application, so it contains also other um, applications in other languages. So it's an e-commerce, it's an e-commerce like, it's a dummy e-commerce uh, that uh, it's, in, in, it's written in five different languages and it, it is in, instrumented with tracing and logs. So you can have a look about how it works in practice over there. So thank you for your time and let me know if you have any questions.